Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the show. Our guest for today is another interesting uh, guest. He's the founder of Helpful Docs, a managed network of free screen technical writers with SaaS and API experience that provide knowledge-based help video product guides and all the other helpful documents that users need for their business or organization. And aside from that, he's also an enthusiastic in giving advice to startups about sales and growth. So without further ado, listen, listeners, please help us welcome our guest for today, Akis Laupo. Um, hey, Akis. Hi. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hi, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here. So let's start off with a very basic question. And we'd like to know, uh, know a bit about yourself. So um, basically, um, my startup path uh, kind of like started in the, uh, around 2012. So I, uh, I founded a B2B SaaS back then, uh, and, and I didn't have any experience with B2B SaaS, and I didn't have any experience with AI. It was B2B SaaS with AI for hotel bookings. Um, so uh, it was a very difficult, a very, very difficult, um, uh, you know, decision. And it was a very difficult process as well, because I had to learn how to build a company, how to build, um, you know, a team, how to do sales, how to do everything. And I raised $480,000 from a VC back then. So um, there was also the, the issue, of, no, not the issue, but like the, the let's say the chapter of learning how to raise money, how to manage investors and investor expectations and all of that. And so it was a bit too much learning. So um, we failed with my co-founders. We failed on, on a few of those. And so the company didn't continue after the first three years. So um, from 2015 until recently, I've been working with a number of uh, mostly B2B SaaS companies and I've been helping them with growth and sales. I've led... Uh, several teams like joint teams that were working on revenue basically because it comes down to revenue um, and uh, I've also acted as, uh, as an advisor uh, but not, not part of the team as an external advisor to several startups and so um, during the last mostly I would say the last two to three years after working with a number of teams I kind of like realized that um, sales is not so much of a huge problem, like if you know how to do it, if you hire the right people, if you know the strategies and everything, it can be done. Um, on the other side, growth tactics and, and stuff like that, um, they, there's a lot of knowledge, there are a lot of expertise, a lot of experts out there. But when it comes to product and product documentation, um, there was a gap in the market. So that's what led me to the creation of the company. And I can tell you more details, of course, uh, about how specifically, you know, what exactly did we did we see as an opportunity here for creating this company? But uh, that's kind of like the high level description. Fantastic. Nice. I love the journey and, and, and I love how proud you're talking about how your first one failed, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, 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 it's actually, and, and it's a thing, right? Like people that are serial entrepreneurs, I mean, it's okay to have a couple of quote unquote failures, but, but you learn a lot from it, right? So when, when you started, um, let's say your third business now, I guess, um, how, what learnings are you bringing along from that 2012 B2B SaaS business in AI? What did you carry over and, and what are you doing differently because of it? That's a very good question. So uh, I would say that the, the biggest learning has to do with um, operations, which was not my strength. Um, so managing teams, managing people, managing processes. Um, so that would be the most important aspect, how you hire, how you fire and how you manage people. Um, and then how you layer on top of, of that workflows and operational processes that enable people to do their best work and the and without losing focus and and being able to manage this efficiently without burning out and um you know uh, uh like just sustainably having to do uh, sorry uh, continuously having to do an unsustainable level of um of work so 
that was a, a huge lesson. And, and after that opportunity, it, during between 2015 and 2021, I actually had the opportunity to work with several founders. And I, I realized that each founder is excellent. I mean, at least the founders that can make it happen, they can make it work. They're excellent in some skills. Not like no one is great at everything, but there are like sales led founders, the ones that are very strong in sales. There are tech led founders that are very strong in technology and, and they it's like they, they grow through that skill. Um, there are a number of other like types of skills. And so by working with different people and having the opportunity to work very closely with founders that were excellent at operations, um, which was my weak kind of like thing, um, skill set, then I, I feel that that was the, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest lesson that, that I'm carrying forward. Phenomenal. And, and now you're your current, um, your current business, right? Uh, how old is Helpful Docs? So it's just one year. Uh, a one yeah. year old company. Uh, let's maybe learn a little bit about that if that's possible and maybe start with what problem are you solving? Yeah, so basically going back to the, to the origins of what led to the creation of Helpful Docs. So initially um, I was helping a number of B2B SaaS uh, teams and for some teams documentation uh, is equally important to basically the product itself. So if it's a complex product, there's a learning curve. People don't understand how to use the product and, and it takes time for someone to understand how to get value from the product. You need to have documentation that is suitable, you, like checking the box of just having documentation without going any deeper and just having the basic, just a few screenshots, that's okay. But in most cases, it's not good enough because users expect certain things and you have to have the right documentation. So as I was working with those uh, B2B SaaS teams, I, I, I was tasked with finding uh, people that could actually help us shape our documentation strategy. So how do we write the right documentation? What is right documentation? Should it be long? Should it be short? What combination of articles should we have? Do we use videos? Do we not use videos? All of that. And then I was talking to a number of companies in the industry because it's not something new. It's not unique. Like there, there are probably hundreds or not thousands of companies in this space, in the technical writing space. But there's a lot, like the vast majority, they're working on enterprise uh, solutions. So they work with, you know, I don't know, like IKEA or that sort of level of companies. And so their processes, their minimum, um, minimum project value and so on, they, they are not suitable for, uh, for SaaS businesses, which most of them, they're not like multi-billion dollar uh, companies. So that was the first issue. And the second issue is that they don't understand SaaS and APIs. So the people that are able to, to write um, good documentation are the people that have worked in SaaS teams and they've supported you know, either they've worked on the customer success side of things or the customer support side of things or the dev teams. Um, so they, they need to have some experience. So I found that there's very limited experience. There's a lot of people that there are a lot of people that know how, you know, how to write a user guide, but that's not enough. So um, we were talking to several companies and it was always the same thing, either too expensive or no idea how to do this. Plus, there's also the issue of knowing the tools. So, for example, in the startup ecosystem, um, you know, uh, it's, there are a number of tools which are kind of like commonly used. For example, Slack. So if you hire someone and they don't know your, te your, your tech stack, they're not familiar with the tools, Apart from learning what the company does and how it works, they also have to learn the tools that you use, which is an additional learning curve. So being familiar with the tech stack that most B2B SaaS um, and API first companies use, that was also a big gap. So uh, I was ready for a change. I had accumulated a lot of experience at that point and I said, <laughs> it seems <laughs> there's a gap in the market. And so if I'm, the, if I'm searching that actively and I can't find a solution, then probably others are searching as well. And uh, I, I wasn't proven wrong. So I, w I was very happy that we actually did that project and we searched because it led to the creation of Helpful Docs. 
Nice. I like how you. I like how you say that. Yeah, you were you know filling filling in the gap. So helpful, Doc. Is filling in that type of gap. Just like we started, we were all filling filling in a gap that we saw that needed to build. And uh, what I just wanted to to ask as well, despite the challenges and that you faced. Akis and like the the failure that you you had in the past, what has kept you motivated to to push through? And you, like you mentioned earlier, that there should be like there are hundreds of companies that probably offer the same type of services. But what keeps you motivated? Despite the um, I think the that, that's a good question because you can lose motivation especially when things go down uh when the you know you didn't manage to to reach the milestone that you wanted to reach and then it's it take it's taking much longer for example so there are a lot of reasons why people would lose motivation but i think that if on every single interaction you're having with customers and prospects and on every single search when you when you look at your competitors and at the market you realize the the potential and the value that you bring on the table. Um, that for me is enough for you know keep continuing to push through. If I start seeing that what we have to offer as a team um, is not that different from what others are offering already, and they are established players and so on and so on, then at that point I would start feeling a bit weird about uh, you know what we're doing. So there is that theory that execution is above all. So even if you go into a market that has a thousand competitors, if you execute, you know, uh, if you're the best at execution, you're going to actually have a, an advantage compared to the others. But I think here it's not about execution. It's about actually creating, um, offering a combination of things that are not available in the market, or it's very, very difficult to find them if they, you know, if someone needs to find something like this. And and I do have a couple of follow up questions on on what you just mentioned, right? So so you your clients so so correct me if I'm wrong. Your clients are B two B SaaS providers, yeah, yeah. right? That that want that are not your billion dollar companies. They want to have tech writing down for the tech that they are creating, especially if it's API based. Uh, and that's where you come in with all your technical expertise, but also your business expertise, and you build a team that does exactly yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Now. Um, how do you scale that up? How do like you're now one year into business, right? How I mean, tell us a little bit about your growth journey and and where do you see yourself in a couple of years as well, right? Uh, it's very interesting for 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 our listeners to understand, like an entrepreneur like yeah. yourself, how you start something out of nothing and how where you are today, and but also where you think you'll be by by the next year. Yeah, so right now we're just uh, approaching the 50th uh, customer. So um, now with 50 customers is not a, <laughs> a crazy number, but um, I'm, I'm a true believer in, in taking it slow in the beginning to make sure that you don't hyper grow. One of the ma major mistakes as a sales and growth person that I did in previous roles and previous businesses I've created was that I was going out there talking to leads, generating demand, closing customers without the necessary product or service or infrastructure operations behind. And then it was a complete collapse. Um, so I, this time with the experience, I'm actually taking it slower uh, and I'm, I'm just very gradually reaching out to new companies and, and taking it very slow so that we, we reach a point which is now, the point where we've fine-tuned all the details, we're beyond um, the MVP version of uh, Helpful Docs. So now we're ready to actually start talking to a lot more companies because it's, um, there, are no, there are not that many unknowns anymore. Um, so it's pretty predictable. Companies that work with us are happy. We've never lost a customer. Companies that have worked with us in the past um, I mean, th we did one project and then there's a, th they stick with us because they, th they see the value and they want to stay with us. So I think that now we're ready to, you know, go to the next step. So, and, um, so I'm actually convinced. I don't think I, I made it sound like I'm not sure. <laughs> um, 
Now, in terms of the goals of next steps uh, for next year or, ne or the next two years, so I think that because we're basically a tech-enabled productized service, um, so we uh, our focus like we, we need to double down on the things that we do really well and outsource as much the the things that are not a core part of our work. So, for example, um, there is the uh, there are two things which are core elements for us and that are going to enable us to grow. So one thing is recruiting. So we have to actually productize recruiting to the point where it becomes near frictionless and we haven't done that yet. So it takes a bit of energy still like human time to um, you know, kind of do a few things. And the, the second thing is actually going a bit deeper in our own tech stack so that we can integrate with much more um, tools when it comes to publishing the content so that we have less manual tasks. So um, once we do this, I think that any scalability bottlenecks would be completely removed and then it's up to us um, as a team. I mean, me as a founder, but as a team in, in general to, to reach whatever level you know we, we want to reach. Now... But I, as a general high-level comment with regards to growth, so this is a lifestyle business for me. So I'm not uh, planning to actually go for like a VC round. I, I went through down that route and I know how it is. If at some point we're ready to take on investment, for example, for going to, for doing a next milestone, that would be, you know, with more founder-friendly type of um, financial uh, partners. So there are a lot of in the market right now which are not going for like the unicorn and billion dollar status. But you know we would never we would never go down that route. It sounds like you're talking from experience. Uh, the founder friendly financial providers. It sounds like you, yes. <laughs> it sounds like you have some very high bar uh, based on what you said. And you, you touched upon a couple of very interesting topics, right? Uh, I admire the discipline of taking a step back to set the foundation to then move fast based on that, as opposed to moving too fast too quickly. Clearly, again, something you learned with experience. Um, and another thing, and I think this is, we can shift gears towards this direction, is um, a, a motto that we always have is do what you do best, outsource the rest, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and you mentioned recruitment is something you want to, is a core of what you do. Keep that in house. Your tech, keep that in house, right? Uh, that, as I've understood you correctly, yep. that's co core to your business, mm -hmm. core to your operations, and everything else is something you could easily do much more cost effectively and actually better um, by by working with the right partners, right? And and have you figured out what those areas are already? Have you figured out what you would be outsourcing? Mm -hmm. Um, versus what you'll be doing. Yeah, we know what you'll keep in house. But have you figured out what you would not keep in house? Yeah. So theoretically, everything else. Um, but that's you know, in theory. Um, now, for example, uh, there are certain things which are like the broader marketing side of things, which has not been that necessary until now. And when I say marketing, I mean like you know Google Ads, Facebook Ads, content marketing, and and like th that component which we haven't done a lot of this, but I feel that as we grow and as we mature as a, as, a, as, a, as a service and as a company, that we will need to do more of that because it's a, it's kind of like a missing piece of, our, of the puzzle. So there are a lot of skills in there. So from content creation to content distribution to like, which I think are, um, they, can, they can very easily be um, outsourced, but like in a, um, in a managed way, not outsourcing completely, giving it to someone so that someone acts as a, like they create the strategy, they create the content, they distribute. I don't, I, I don't, I don't really believe in outsourcing the strategy. I think the strategy and the management should be kept in house and then you outsource the work. So, um, so yeah, and, and because we work with an international workforce, so our technical writers, they are from anywhere from Canada, the US, Mexico, Germany, France, uh, Spain, South Africa, the Philippines, India. So, you know, it's, it's like everywhere. We have this DNA in house. It's just that with the technical writers, we're, we're, we work as a team versus with the others, they would, that would be actual outsourcing, like in, in the sense that w they would be contractors, not part of the core team. 
makes perfect sense makes perfect sense and and, and i would think like if, if that's not something you've done the, the 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 content digital marketing component is clearly something you know uh, you you could outsource i feel um going back to a, a interesting point you made so you have all these tech writers from all over the world uh i'm assuming that when you say you recruit them is you you give them full-time salary they become part of your company is that correct well is that how that works or, or do they work 50, like 50. Or do they work like Okay. Yeah, so some of them, they work full-time um, and basically they are, um, they are assigned to a number of projects. So it's a bit of a similar structure like, you know, the large consultancies company, consulting companies like McKinsey and Accenture and all of those, where you have uh, a team of people which are assigned to different customers, like as accounts, and they can be on one big account or three smaller accounts, so depending on the complexity and the, the workload. Um, yeah, but in terms of the the hiring process, everyone is is hired as an as a contractor, but the relationship is different. In term, like I mean, from a financial and accounting point of view, um, so uh, but the the relationship is different. They are part of the team. We have compensation benefits and 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 bonuses at the end of the year, so it's it's a different uh, different thing. That's. That's what I meant. And I guess the point I was getting to was um, ultimately your business will thrive if you hire the right writers, yeah. right? Ultimately, that's, I mean, the technology will be there to enable it, streamline it, but clearly, quote unquote, your product is also your 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 writers, yes. right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and are the people that you, and that's why, so I understand where you're coming from with your recruitment. Okay, got it, got it, got it. All right. Very, very interesting. So. What are your goals for next year, Akis? So for, uh, for me, I would be perfectly happy if we double in size. I don't uh, want to go any further than that. So if we end 2022 with 100 customers, that would be great. And then from the following year, I think we can set more uh, ambitious goals. But for now, you know, that I would be more than happy with that. And then you can start another company. <laughs> no, I think we... <laughs> everything that you've learned. <laughs> no, I think, I think we can easily get this company to 500 <laughs> to 700 customers uh, without, um, like, you know, uh, moving into a completely different sphere of, of um, operations and, and financial requirements and so on. So, yeah. So, but that's, uh, at least that's my view right now. Um, my change. <laughs> and maybe a question I have as well. Uh, so, based... In your past life, you were advising other startups, right, and other businesses. Are you still giving back? Uh, because you, you mentioned it's more of a lifestyle business. Does it also give you time to do other things beyond, or is this all-encompassing, uh, all-consuming? I mean, for you, this business. Yeah, no. In, as a um, like in terms of my professional time, uh, I that's fully dedicated to helpful docs, but I do have an open communication with quite a few founders simply because I've been very close to them. And whenever, you know, if I can contribute to something like, for example, I have, um, I'm involved in some companies in the shareholding uh, as well. So, um, you know, whenever I can contribute on something, but, but as an external contributor, like advisor, not, not actively undertaking a project and working with them. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, um, Akis, maybe one uh, uh, last question before before we go. Considering that it's uh, you know we're almost uh, out of time. You mentioned earlier you had a, a three year old, and now with your with your startup with Helpful Docs, how do you manage to stay productive with your startup and uh, and a toddler at home? Hmm. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a bit of a struggle, um, but I think that uh, you know, it's, at least the way we've done it is that we've clearly distributed the hours with my wife, um, and then you know, I know when I, I I it's my time with him, and when it's her time uh, with him, and so it's uh, we're we're managing. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to you know build a company while you have a three year old and. And obviously, um, a two-year-old when I was starting. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. But I, I think like 
it's a it's an interesting challenge because you have to be able at least that's my belief you you have to be able to to manage more than one thing in your life more than one dimension in your life otherwise it feels like ah no i have a child so i'll focus all my energy on the child that's great but you know it's i think it's better if you can if 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 you have the luxury because i think it's a luxury if you can you know push yourself to achieve more it sounds to yeah. me like your your past experience in business and how you learned to be a, a more a better operator and better at operations has been very helpful yes. for the last year. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. It a bit of like operational it requires management. a very skilled ops person. Yeah. <laughs> operational <laughs> management uh, in the house, in the family. Exactly. Uh, and, and maybe I have a question and maybe something for our listeners as well, uh, Ake. So um, what, what advice would you give to, to anyone that is, you know, uh, starting a business, running a business? Uh, based on your experience, what would be like if uh, maybe let me rephrase it. If you could speak to yourself, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, what would you tell yourself? Yeah, advice uh, would be difficult because I think really everyone has a unique path. But in terms of talking to myself seven, eight years ago, um, I was very much into the hype. Of startups, I was. Uh, I think I, I was one of those people that you would see in all the startup events, the startup conferences. I've won startup competitions and all of that. Um, and I was. Uh, I was attracted by that concept that, like you know, billion dollar startup from zero to a hundred million, and all of that. So, I think that as you mature, you you focus on what really matters to you, which is kind of like the the satisfaction and the. The, whatever makes you happy anyway within the building company, the company building process. And the rest, it's nice. It's not that it's not nice, but kind of like not that important when, you know, just focus on doing what, you know, what matters and the rest is, is you know, ni nice to have. Like back then I was, uh, I felt that you have to be actively part of an ecosystem and engaging with others for succeeding not as a as a nice to have but as a requirement so that was a big mistake i think because i was devoting a lot of resources and time on that and uh i understand exactly what you're saying uh, focus on what matters uh key takeaway thanks a lot uh Akis. that was a very very thank you insightful. thank you thank you very much for the invitation beautiful Akis. I don't know how old you are, but for somebody who looks very young, you sound quite wise. No, I'm 39. <laughs> Thank I you. became 39 last week. So I'm not that young. <laughs> a wise young man. <laughs> and uh, well, a wise young man for today's episode. And uh, thank you for listening, guys. And thank you, Akis, for joining us thank today. You. One last thing, Akis, if you could just please tell our listeners how they can reach you or how they can find Helpful Docs. So, yeah, so this is the, the best place would be to, uh, to go to helpfuldocs.com. And uh, my email is al at helpfuldocs.com. Um, so they can reach me there. Fantastic. And uh, once again, thank you, Akis. This is Jacqueline de Menk. Thank you. I'm Wouter Delbare. Stay tuned for the next episode of Mangtas Nation.